Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Susan Axelrod, editor of Culture, The Word on Cheese, and I'm very excited to be here with you this afternoon, and also with Chef Damien Sansonetti, to talk about and cook with the iconic cured ham of France. And in French, it's called Jambon de Bayon, but here on this side of the Atlantic, we call it Bayon ham. A few housekeeping details before we get started. First of all, we're going to watch a little video, a short video filmed in France, and then Chef Damien's gonna jump right in to doing his four recipes, which I'm sure you're gonna love. If you wanna ask us some questions, there's a chat feature, and we ask anything you like. We'll do our best to answer it during the presentation, or some of the questions we may wait until the very end for uh, the Q&A session. And now, I'd like to thank both the consortium, actually, I'm sorry, on behalf of my colleagues at Culture Media, I would like to thank the consortium du Jambon de Bayon, Chef Damien Sansonetti, and Fork Food Lab, which is our venue for today. And now let's watch the video. This is a certified Bayonne ham. It holds the secrets of a thousand years of honored traditional practices, terroir, and ancient ingredients. Long, Bam, Gers, the Adour Basin is a unique geography formed by a perfect union of sea and mountain. As Europe's original connection to the Iberian Peninsula, it's the pride of a region with a rich and storied history. This is why the Bayonne Ham is the pride of our region. Now I'm thrilled to introduce Chef Damien Sansonetti of Cheval Restaurant in Portland, Maine, one of the most popular restaurants in this foodie city. And Chef Damien owns the restaurant with his wife, Ilma Lopez, a James Beard Award nominated pastry chef. And before he came here to Maine, he spent several years working for Daniel Balloud in New York uh, as the executive chef of Bar Balloud and in several other roles. So he certainly knows his way around French cuisine, which is why we asked him to be part of this presentation today. So Chef Damien, why don't you tell us what you're going to prepare for us? Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. This is going to be fun. Um, we created uh, four recipes uh, today for this. Um, we're going to be doing a uh, focaccia, almost like a no-knee style focaccia, finished with crispy uh, bay on him and bacon. They're kind of like a jambon uh, bread, basically. We're going to be doing a uh, Basque style mac and cheese with um, some uh, ham into it as well, and some asparagus wrapped in uh, bay on ham, and stuffed, cheese stuffed dates wrapped in bay on ham too. So a couple different looks, a couple of different recipes that are pretty versatile and you can use for dinner parties, um, snacks, um, all kind of fun stuff. So let's get started off first with our bread. So what we're gonna wanna get started off with first is um, we are gonna bake some of our ham. So you're gonna start with a sheet tray. Um, and parchment paper. We're gonna grab some of our ham beautiful slices and then you're just going to kind of lay them down and you're going to want to bake this at about 375 in a regular oven or about 350 in a convection um, in a convection it might curl up a little bit on you it's going to be fine um, we're going to be crisping these up afterwards so it doesn't really matter but one of the things that i really love about bayonne ham too is that it's beautiful in its natural state. Like it's absolutely delicious. It's tasty. It's awesome. But when you cook with it, the flavor of the ham and of the uh, pork comes out so much. And the salinity of it plays off very well with um, vegetal flavors. And it works well with a lot of other um, fats, like in good cheeses and stuff like that. And that's why I wanted to create some dishes that really play up um, those flavors in the ham. And this is a ham that we're really familiar with. We use it um, at the restaurant. If you've ever been to Cheval, you may have seen it on our menu into some cooked dishes as well as 
some of them on our cured meats uh, selection too. So we're just gonna bake these guys in the oven for roughly about 10 minutes until they get nice and crispy. And while Damien's doing that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Bayonne ham which has been made the same way for a thousand years. The legend goes that a hunter discovered a perfectly preserved boar at the saltwater source in Salais de Berne, which is in the, at the foothills of the Pyrenees. Gaston Fibus, the Count of Foix, had wounded the animal during a hunt, but it escaped and was not discovered until months later, perfectly preserved in salt. The basic aspects of the production of this ham are salt, pork first, salt, air, and thyme. And all Bayonne ham is made in a strictly defined geographical zone between the Pyrenees and the Atlantic Ocean. The pigs come from this area as well. And Bayonne ham has been a protected geographical indication of PGI products since 1998. What is PGI? an official EU guarantee that guarantees, a guarantee that guarantees quality and provenance. So the pork is also from PGI pigs that are raised in the southwest of France, were allowed to graze naturally and never treated with steroids or antibiotics. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Damien. So happy pigs make happy pigs. Um, so we're gonna start our bread off. And this is a really cool recipe because it's almost like a no need style recipe. and. If anybody is ever afraid of baking bread or doing anything like that, this is kind of the recipe for you or for an extra baker or if you don't have a lot of time in your hand. This is basically, we're gonna, we have our instant yeast. I believe everybody's gotten familiar with instant yeast over uh, the past year. Um, we put a little bit of sugar because yeast loves uh, sugar to feed it a little bit. Then we have some warm water. This is gonna balloon everything together. Our whisk it. Get everything dissolved in there. Once everything's dissolved, we let it sit for about a minute or two. And then we have our four and a half cups of all purpose flour, just your regular flour. You don't need anything extra special or anything for that. Um, and then we're gonna take, you can use either a spatula or a wooden spoon, and we're just gonna add this flour into here. And we're gonna incorporate it in nicely, little by little. We're gonna add about a third of that flour in, stir it around. This is where those big bowls that you have in your pantry come in handy to you. Otherwise, uh, you end up wearing half of your flour when you start to stir it around. Been there, done that myself. Add the rest of it in there so you can see it's getting stirred around. It's coming together nicely. Sometimes, depending upon the recipe, if you feel like your flour is not coming together after you add everything together and it's a little dry, feel free to add a tablespoon or so of more water if you need to. Because depending upon where you're at, when you make this recipe, the temperature, the humidity, um, your flour might need to be a little more hydrated. So feel free to add a tablespoon or two of water if you need. It's not going to hurt the recipe. Because what we're going to do is we're going to incorporate this up together. Then we're going to place it into um, another bowl that's been um, rubbed with uh, some extra virgin olive oil and then let it sit overnight. So you want to let it sit for at least eight hours up to about 24 hours and you just stick it in your fridge um, covered overnight. So and then you take it out the next day. So you can see it's pretty much all together there. But it's like kind of looks like string cheese a little bit, you know, or like stracciatella or when you make a mozzarella. And then you just want to fold everything in just to get those last couple little pieces of bread in, or of the flour into the bread dough. And you can tell, see, it's not sticking to my hands too much. So that's really good. So it's just a little tacky. And Damien, let's talk about why the Bayonne ham works so well with this kind of bread. It's, it's great because we're, when we're going to put it in and afterward when we explain that, it 
the flavor comes out really, really nice and it adds the texture because this bread's gonna have a lot of nice texture to itself. But the ham really comes out really, really good when you bake it and then it's kind of gonna get a double bake. So we bake it and get it crispy to begin with first and then we're gonna add it again and it's gonna perfume. When you're baking this stuff in your house, your house is gonna smell so good. Well, it smells really good right here, right now. I can smell it. So basically this is our dough ball. You know, you can see my hands are not too sticky and I don't want to stop sticking to them. So then basically what we're going to do then is we're going to take about a tablespoon or two of oil. You know, you get it in your bowl and you just kind of put that in there, rub it around so that basically the outside of that dough ball is covered in oil. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take this guy, you're going to cover it, stick it in the fridge until tomorrow. And then we actually have one that we have, we took out that we made up from left over last night that's already been proofing out for us. So let's take a look at that guy right So we know that this ham is cured in salt, but one of the things that I've noticed um, as I've just been enjoying it on its own and in, in cook dishes and in, in salads and things is that it doesn't have an overly salty flavor which I think is really nice. Um, and to me, that's kind of amazing. The fact that you, you cure this, this meat and salt, and yeah, it comes out and it doesn't It's have, super balanced, it's yeah. great. That's what makes it versatile for cooking and for eating in its natural form. So we have these half hotel pans. Um, you can use like a, like a cookie baking, like a brownie dish or something, like a 13 by nine or whatever you have. Something that has sides. We're gonna, you're gonna just rub this with some olive oil if you don't like olive oil, you can use pan spray in here, or you can use a little bit of butter, just some kind of fat. And then you're gonna dump that dough ball in there, put it in there, spray the top of it with um, some pan spray, because that way you're gonna cover it with plastic. So when you do that, this is, so we had this guy sitting, and now it comes right off beautifully. You can see, you know, you can see it's nice and springy and jiggly. That's a good ferment on there. You can see that you got some, you got some, some bubbles in there and everything already, right? So that's what we want to see, huh? So next we're going to take, we already got our, our ham and we crisped it up already. So it's beautiful, it's nice. Look at that beautiful, look at the color of the fat that comes out of it too. Look how nice and golden that looks in there and everything. So we're going to take this, we're going to take a little bit of olive oil. Do a little olive oil on here. And then we're going to take our crispy ham and crunch it up even a little more. Make sure you get it all the way around. Give every little nook and cranny of this bread some love. Don't leave anybody out. Think of it like you're making a chips ahoy. Every single bite's gonna have to have some ham. <laughs> so get that going around. And I believe the recipe called for, I think three ounces. You can use the whole three ounces. You can use half of it if you want. It's all up to you. So then we have this in here, and then we're just gonna take our fingers and look at that. You can, you can kind of see how far my fingers go in there already. And that's releasing out some of those gases. And that's what's gonna give me this beautiful dimpled shape of everything too. But this is also pushing in some of this ham that's into there. And you just kind of massage the ham down inside. What a fun project for your kids. Oh yeah, kids love making this bread because it's so much fun. It's almost kind of like whack-a-mole with, uh, with the ham. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna take this and we're gonna bake it. Now, depending on what kind of oven you have, and if you, like I bake it in a convection oven at 450 and it takes about 20, 22 minutes. If you have a conventional oven, it might take closer to 30. But a good rule of thumb is when it's nice and golden brown, and we'll show you later when it comes out of the oven, we're gonna tap on it and it has like a hollow sound. That's when you know your focaccia is done. All right, so we're gonna stick this guy in the oven. Okay, and then what's next? What's next? We're gonna go into um, one of my personal favorites. We're gonna wrap some asparagus in ham. And I love this dish because asparagus season just started. And, you know, it's the spring. So what better way to showcase some beautiful asparagus? So I know that, you know, where you're at and what kind of asparagus you can get, we have some um, 
Asparagus from California is actually delta queen asparagus that we have. Really, really nice asparagus. You can see beautiful purple tops on it. We have a kind of like a standard and a large asparagus here. So I wanted to kind of give two different looks on that. Um, and for this recipe, you know, we have a little bit of olive oil. Um, we have our salt and pepper. We're also going to make a walnut honey. We have some hard cheese to grate on top of it afterwards. But this recipe, it's pretty cool because this is something you make up. Um, and then afterwards, you can kind of let it hang out because you don't need to eat it really hot. You want to have it so that it's got um, some time on it to cool down for you. So we're going to lay out some of our ham here. And in these retail packs, it's great because you can get this stuff like this and it's already in the full sheets portion out for you and it makes it so easy to work with. So we're going to take these guys. And you're let's, gonna, let's move maybe some of the asparagus off yeah, the side let's so move we these can off see the side what you're doing. So. so we're going to take our asparagus, we're going to trim the bottoms up. You know, usually I go up to like about the second. Um, portion of the little leaves are on there. Do you, do you season it or marinate it first at all? Yep, we're gonna, we're gonna give it a quick little toss and a little bit of olive oil and season it with salt and pepper. You know, we talked about a little bit about the um, pigs and the this luscious fat that's on the ham. And it's not a, um, you know, everybody, well, now keto is the thing, so maybe fat isn't as much of a, a bad guy as it used to be. But um, this fat and this ham just melts in your mouth. It's amazing. And you can see that it's a slogan, and I didn't do that on purpose. Um, it, it, the fat really does melt in your mouth. It doesn't get stuck in your teeth, and none of that. Um, and um, let's watch how, they, how David's cutting these on the so angle. We're gonna cut these guys at an angle so you kind of have like a little other triangle. So you have just cut them on a diagonal. Make sure you cut right through them. And then we're gonna take our asparagus spear, and kind of start down at the bottom here and just roll right up with it. You know, and then beautiful. just kind of tack it around a little bit and the oil helps to kind of keep it stuck around. I see how these cute little guys like this, and then we have sheets right here. We're just gonna put a little bit of pan spray down. And you got those cute little guys like that, huh? Such a pretty hors d'oeuvre, or, or, you know, to serve a bunch of them as a light lunch, maybe with a salad. And you, I think in your recipe, you even said that you could put them on a salad. Yeah, once they're, the yeah, once they're cool, you can um, cut them in half, depending on how big they are, how thick they are. They're great to put like as a component to a salad. Like this would be great with like a light little frisee salad or some baby greens um, and some nice little uh, like champagne vinaigrette. And it would be, and one thing I love about this ham, this ham goes great with champagne. I love drinking champagne while I'm eating bread. <laughs> That sounds like a perfect thing to do on a beautiful spring day. Yeah. And these, are, this is something that's like, it's fun. Um, it's kind of on a not too difficult scale, but like it's spectacular the end results, to be quite honest with you. And, you know, it comes out, um, you know, and you're like, wow, that's really, really cool. Well, and this is where we really taste the unique characteristics of this ham, which is nutty and lightly sweet and creamy, and it's milder and less salty than some similar hams like prosciutto or serrano. Yeah. It's kind of like the Goldilocks of the ham. It's kind of like right there with the flavors and everything, which makes it really, really great and versatile for a lot of things. And it just, there's things that just bring out the natural characteristics of this ham that just make you want to kind of keep eating. So we talked a little bit about the salt and I found this really fascinating. The salt comes to cure this ham, comes from the Salles de Baron, which are these springs. It's the name of a town and the name of springs. I want those pretty. So you have these guys here. We're just gonna pop these guys in the oven first 
They'll take roughly 10, maybe 12 minutes, depending upon your oven. And you'll notice because the ham will start to get a little crispy when they're baking and they actually get crispier when they start cooling down. You'll notice a difference when they cool down too. You've got that crispy ham done in there. Amazing. Yeah, so I mean, I wish we had smell o vision here because <laughs> the scent of this ham, so you can see when this ham is here, so you can see like these beautiful, nice pieces of ham. And look at the fat dripping off of it. Oh man, I want everything out of here right now. But like, <laughs> this stuff is so good. And, like, look at the fat and how, like, even though it's cooked, you still see the fat because, like, that's, that's like the good fat. Um, and the cured fat in there, and that's going to add flavor into your dishes too with this finished product here as well. So next, we're going to go on oh, to our dates. I so can't wait to see these. We have some beautiful medjool dates, from California. Um, you can use brown dates if you can't find medjool, but usually medjool are pretty pretty easily accessible right now. You can find them in all kinds of stores, health food stores, like pretty much everybody carries them. And they're super versatile. They're great snackers as they are, but you know, we're gonna take these guys here. Um, and we're just gonna cut them, make a little incision right here, open them up, and you just wanna take out that pit. And these are also great because Medjool dates, for how great they are, they're super easy to take out the pits here. You know, sometimes they have a little top in them. Hold them a little closer so you can see what those look like. Yeah. You can kind of see that guy there. So then that way we can take those guys out, okay? Kind of looks like the uh, cocoon from Alien a little bit after John was taking them out. <laughs> and don't be afraid if, like, you know, you cut too deep or you rip it open too much, it's okay. We're going to wrap these guys up. They're not going to see anything afterwards. Well, they're very sticky, so you can sort yeah. of smoosh them back together. Which is yeah, that, that's like the other thing, too. It's like they're just, they're easy to work with, you know? Well, this. Years ago, when I was in the catering business, we used to make these almond stuffed dates wrapped with bacon. It was this ubiquitous catering appetizer. And of course, you could make thousands of them and freeze them and pull them out for a party. But this is such a cool um, up, upgrade on that with the cheese and the brown ham and the walnut honey. I can't wait to see this. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little retro inspired, um, but it's got a new take on everything. So then we have our cheddar here. Um, try to get the block stuff. If for some reason, you know, you can use one of your favorite cheeses too if you want. I like to use this cheddar because it melts really nice. And the block stuff, you can cut it in to the pieces that you need. Um, and don't be afraid if you overcut or undercut your pieces either. Cause like you'll look, all your dates are gonna be a little different. So you can kind of say, okay, that looks there. Cut it a little shorter than what you think you need. I always get a little greedy and I try and stuff too much cheese into everything when I have to put stuff cheese in the thing. So, you know, I always have to like, the first one more like, oh, and I was like, yeah, maybe I'll do this next time. You know, I love cheese. At Culture, we're all about cheese. There's yeah. no such thing and it's too much cheese. So then like we have that guy in there. So then for a second, next guy here, it's a little smaller. I'm gonna stuff that into here. Go up and around see, I can even almost mold that date up and around how I need it to be, you know? So that's why these are great because they're, they're great to work with. They, they, they play well with others, you know? And if you have to cut things up a little smaller or a little thinner, go for it. There's, there's rules, but you know, you can bend them a little bit and you know, you're gonna get the results that you need. Cause we still want the one thing too is about cooking. Um, it's got to be fun and you got to put some love into it. If it's not fun and you can't get the love in there, you know, you're going to, you're going to feel it. That's why you want this to be loved and fun. <laughs> and then we got this guy here. So we're going to break that guy in half. That's going to fit right up in there. Remember when you were telling me about this recipe, you described it as a flavor bomb. Oh, these Too things, bad. these are like almost kind of like when you have them, cause we're going to let them cool down. They're going to be, they're like unabashedly like what they are. They're sweet, they're salty, they're full flavor, they're in your face. You're going to want a cocktail or a glass of wine or champagne with these when you're having them, you know. And they're great for, they're, they're great for cocktail parties because they're going to make you want to keep like having something to drink or, you know, 
grabbing your, uh, whatever your favorite beverage is. And if, if you're doing the, when you're doing these two, if you have your cheese and you can bring your cheese to room temperature a little bit, it's a lot easier to work with two than cheese just fresh right out the fridge. So if you give yourself about a half an hour or so, the cheese is a lot better to work with. General rule of thumb on cheese, actually. Yeah. Have it at room temperature before you work with it, before you eat it. So, so we, when we got here today, Damien, you put the ham in the fridge for a while. Yep. What is your recommendation on how, what temperature do you want to serve it? Say you were just serving it alone on a charcuterie platter. It's nice to try and have a little bit of a, to have it try and come to temperature just a little bit. Even when we serve ham, like our cured hams in the restaurant, we try and wait a couple of minutes before it even goes to the guest because you want to make sure like, you know, it comes from the fridge for storage just because too, when you're slicing these hams up, you want to take a lot of delicate care because like you can see the white fat in here. You have to be delicate when you're slicing this to make sure it stays there like that. But when you serve it, you want to make sure you can try a little bit to bring a little bit of temperature up to it too. So that way it's more enjoyable because that flavor comes out of it a lot more. So these guys here, we're going to kind of start off similar as we did with the other one. And we're going to start down. We're just going to lay them down here. So this is also a really um, sort of economical way to use this product too, because you're not using the whole sheet of ham. Yeah. Um, as with the asparagus. Yeah, but like a little goes a long way for you mm -hmm. to get all the flavor and all of the fun out of this ham. So. We're gonna cut them into long ribbons here, like this. So basically, just gonna cut it in half um, through uh, long ways. You know, and when you cut it, part of the ham, how the muscles go, you're gonna see one section of the muscles. Um, it may not stay kind of completely together. It's gonna to be fine. We'll start with that side wrapping first. Yeah, it all comes together once it's wrapped, and then you yeah, the once oven. it's wrapped right. in the oven, you don't have to worry either. Too like I wanted to make this recipe so like. You don't have to worry about putting the uh, cut edge on the bottom down so it doesn't want crap on itself. This is like supposed to be a fun, good, easy recipe so that you're like in the kitchen having a good time chatting and you know, you're know focusing on having a good time. So we're Another just gonna roll those to up like that. Kids. Oh yeah, dude. Kids love it. I know our daughter would love to make these things. She probably wouldn't need them, but she would definitely like have fun making them. <laughs> She's getting there, she's getting there. So like, see like on this one, like some of the, the muscles are gonna start separating a little bit. I'm just gonna start on that section first for it. So that way I tack it in and see with the ham too, once the ham comes to room temperature, it gets stickier too. So that way you can wrap it around the two on the side. So I know that in France, it's this Bayonne ham is the most, popular, iconic cured ham in the country. Everybody knows Jambon de Bayonne. And um, it's most often eaten just by itself. Um, but it can also be served for breakfast, you know, um, crisped up in a pan with an egg and in salads and in various other ways. Have you experienced, you've been, you've traveled all over yep. Europe. Um, do you have any memories of eating this in France? Um, yeah, one of the first times I went to Paris and I did a little like uh, vacation by myself, I actually did have it um, in the afternoon crisped into a uh, like lightly crisped in a pan with um, a salad with uh, some frisé and um, uh, a light vinaigrette and a kind of like a hard fried egg Ooh, with it. So nice. it was kind of, it was kind of fun. Um, it was great. It was Kind of cool because it was very reminiscent in a sense for myself of like, you know, ham and eggs kind of, you know, in a way. So it was like great and enjoyable that way. But, um, and I, I think every wine bar I went to had they own ham as part of one of their selections laid out there too. And I definitely ate my fair share when I was in Paris, I'll tell you that. So oh, that's how God. these guys are here. So we're going to pop these guys out. Again, anywhere from eight to 10 minutes, depending upon what your oven's like.
So I'm going to go back to talking about the salt from the Salé Bit de Baron. These springs are not, they're, they're saltwater springs. And this really surprised me uh, to learn that the salt did not come from the ocean, which is what we usually assume for salt, but it came out of these springs that are deep within the Pyrenees Mountains. And the salt water there is 10 times saltier than the ocean. So this salt is dried, uh, the water is left out for the salt to dry, and that's what's used to make these hands. So you have this whole, it, it's simple and it's complex at the same time. You have the pigs that are raised um, naturally, they are fed some, some non-GMO corn and other grains to fatten them up, and those grains often come from the same farm where the pigs are raised, or they co it comes from a nearby farm. So you have these very special pigs. You have the entire process controlled by the consortium from start to finish. You have the salt from this special place, and then you have the air, the particular air that exists between the Pyrenees and the Atlantic Ocean that is what creates the hand. You ready to go? Let's do this. Yeah. So while our dates are in the oven, we're going to make a little walnut honey to kind of just delicately dress them once they're done and cooled off. So we have some uh, toasted walnuts that we crushed up. There's about a quarter of a cup here. We're just going to put that in a pot with a little bit of a uh, fresh ground black pepper. Um, if you have already ground halibut butcher pepper, you can use that or right from your pepper mill, it's fine too. We want to use black pepper so it's a little more pungent. And then we have some beautiful wildflower honey. We're gonna put that in here. We kind of, we're just gonna bring this up to a really quick simmer um, for ourselves, just so that it kind of infuses some of the flavor in there. And this is gonna give us another little textural aspect and it's gonna give it a nice little zing to these as well. So we're just gonna let that kind of go of a medium flame. And while that's going, I'm gonna start talking about our uh, next dish. Oh, this is this is the pièce de résistance, shall we say, the Basque style, smoky Basque style macaroni and yeah. cheese. Yeah, so we're gonna start off, we're gonna make a, um, a nice bechamel with uh, onions and a little bit of garlic powder and some peanuts, some smoked uh, paprika, some peanuts. So we're gonna be using some of our house-made uh, Jamelli pasta right here. Um, I like this pasta for this dish because it's um, really got a good toothiness to it. Um, it holds on to the sauce really nice and it's versatile. So we're gonna be making it on the stove top, but if you like your macaroni and cheese kind of a bake style, you can just make this Put it into a pan and stick it right in the oven and bake it too afterwards if you like that baked kind of style and get that nice crispy crust on there as well too so you can go and do that afterwards as well too now the cheese that we got for this guy we're gonna use about a cup and a half to two cups of this beautiful basque cheese and it's called well we tried to get uh, so we're rotting which is the classic cheese of the basque region well there are a couple the idiazabal in spain and um also we in France. And none of our usual sources uh, had any stock of also Irati, but we did get this cheese, which is called Le Secret de Decompostal. It's beautiful cheese. It's similar in the Oso Irati. It's a little more like kind of brown buttery nuttiness to it. You can see kind of like, I, I cut off the, the rind of it, but you can see the, um, how the, the cheese kind of has that beautiful tan and it fades inside to the nice, you know, semi-firm paste and everything. And it's just, it's beautiful. And like, again, you can use this stuff. Um, you can use, if you can't find that, or Oso Rate, you can use Comte or Gruyere work really well too um, for all of those. And they're just going to vary in kind of like how nutty and rich they are and stuff like that too. So, but you do want to find some of a nicer, nicer semi-firm cheese for this dish. So we're going to start going into this next. It's also significant that this is a sheep's milk cheese, um, as is also the Rossi. So sheep's milk cheeses um, are, have a whole different characteristic to them as do goat milk cheeses and cow milk cheeses. But the sheep's milk cheeses are very traditional in the Basque region of France. Yeah. 
And so we have our, our shredded cheese here. So we're going to start off with this guy. Let's get our, this is our. Oh, that's beautiful. So you can see that. So now like you can see like with the heat, how the, the honey went from like being like super, super, uh, let me see if I can get that in there a little more, super um, sticky to like, it's kind of like, like liquidy, like water almost kind of in a sense now. But like now it's, it's infused with that walnut flavor. So we're just gonna keep that off to the side somewhere kind of warm. So whenever our dates come out, we can just anoint them with everything there. So we're gonna make a, a bechamel with this. So we're gonna start off, we have some uh, diced butter here. Whenever you have um, butter at home, it's always uh, great to have unsalted butter because you can always add salt to your butter. So, um, and we use some local stuff here for this. And we have our flour and we do a roux. So this is a third of a cup and a third of a cup. When you're making a roux for whatever recipe you want to do for, it's always good to go half and half. Sometimes you can even go a little more flour than butter, depending on what you want to make it a little more firmer. We always want to go bare minimum, the same volume um, or weight of your fat to your flour. So we're going to lightly melt that in here, but we're going to change it up a little bit because we're going to, we're going to sneak in some uh, diced onions. We bring a lot up some onions here for this. It's about a half a Spanish onion. If you don't want to bring one up by hand, um, you can also do it in uh, like a little food processor. You can do it in like those little choppers they have. And you can even use your slap chop if you got one of those guys. So um, <laughs> if they still make those, I don't know. Those were fun commercials. Um, but you, we have this, so we're gonna sweat this out. This is gonna flavor our roux too. If it's smaller, it's not gonna get all stuck up and everything. It's gonna add more depth of flavor to our, uh, our cheese. So we're just gonna put that in there. And just slowly sweat them out, start getting them translucent, okay? You wanna do this over about a medium to medium high heat, and just keep an eye out. We're gonna add a little kick of spice to this too, right? It's got a little. Yep, so we're gonna use some garlic powder here. Um, I wouldn't use raw garlic into it because you have a chance of burning it, because um, garlic goes, cooks super, super fast, and how small we have to cut it up. So garlic powder is a great thing for this. Um, I love garlic powder, it's great. Um, dried, like powdered spices and great dried herbs are a nice tool to have in your kitchen to add other flavors into things. Um, when yes, you don't want to use like the fresh ingredients because there are they, they do have a big place in the kitchen. Yeah, it's not cheating to use no. garlic powder. There is a place for it. No, no there's, there's a lot of places that, I mean, whenever we do certain like pates or terrines or sausages, the recipes work better with the dried ingredients than the fresh ingredients because they just won't work really well together at all. So you need to have that, but you also need to have good quality ones too. Like the good quality stuff may cost like a buck or two more, but what you get out of it is so much more of a flavor and they're fresher and they burn. Um, then we also have some pimentone here. Um, this is sweet pimentone, so it's smoked paprika. Um, this is going to give us a little smoky aspect of it. It's going to kind of turn our um, bechamel a little rosé color. To it too, so it's nice. So see, we kind of got, we got the. Um, they're starting to sweat out a little bit, a little translucent here. That's when you can kind of like start smelling. Like, mm, yeah, it smells good. Let's check in on our asparagus really quick. I think it's been about ten minutes. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So while that's sweating out, we have these guys here. So check this out. So we have this stuff here. So you can see like the asparagus is cooked. The ham is, you know, cooked and sucked right tight on there. So while we have this, we're gonna put this guy down. And then I have, I have manchego. You can use, if you don't have manchego, you can use Parmesan, you can use nice Romano, Asiago, some kind of a firmer cheese. And you're gonna wanna just kind of go over top of them and grate a little bit with a microplane because right when they come out of the oven, because it's kind of kind of just melt over top of them and add another little cheesy element to all of this. And it's just gonna melt on top of everything. And it's gonna add another little layer of wow to it. So let's take those guys and let them rest off. So 
All right, so our onions are great. Now we're going to add in our flour to make our roux. And when you have the exact amounts into this, it kind of comes together right away. And that's what you want. And then we're going to add in our garlic powder right now. And I'm also going to put a little bit of salt and a little bit of fresh pepper. Whenever you're cooking and your dish has a couple of different steps, it's always nice to season in layers. So now that roux is all cooked up, we're going to add in our milk. A cup and a half of milk here. If you've never made mac and cheese from scratch, if you're, and you know, for some of us, there's nothing wrong with the cracked box or the, you know, that's comfort food. But <laughs> if you've never made it yourself, you should give it a try because the flavor, especially this particular one with the onion and smoked paprika and the bayon ham, naturally, yep. is really special. So I'm going to switch up to a whisk now because when you're making your roux, if you use a whisk while you're making your roux with the onions in there, everything's going to get caught up in there. You're going to have a grid block and everything. It's not going to work out as well. So we're switching up now so we can break everything up and get that roux cooking and get that all activated so it thickens for us. I'm smelling those dates too. That's not and it literally starts to work right away. You know, but then we're going to cook it over a low flame for a couple more minutes. And do you want to, you want to keep your eye on it? You want to let it keep going. So we're going to lower our flame. We want to cook that flour out, okay? So then we're going to have our cheese right next to us over there. So then whenever it's ready, we're going to whisk in our cheese. So when this is all going on, you have your pot of water boiling for your pasta. So we already had pre-cooked some of our pasta here. So you can see with this Jamelli, like how beautiful and fat it cooks up and it's still nice and al dente. So you can see from this and the pasta holds really well. And it kind of adds like an, an almost a half size to it with this right here. So while this is cooking up now, we're gonna add in our smoked paprika. So I just wanna to touch on a couple more points while Damien's doing that about um, this beautiful, delicious ham. The ham from PGI pigs, the pork from PGI pigs, actually has high levels of unsaturated fatty acids and low saturated fatty acids, which is amazing considering it's pork and it does have fat. It's also high in protein and lean meat. So this is pork that's really good for you. It's gonna make your hair shine. <laughs> Oh my gosh, those are Check beautiful. These Look at these guys. Whoa, huh? whoa, here, yeah. Let's Get in the line, they're delicious. So check those out. So, <laughs> you know, you can see like, and that's why like using the, using the block piece of cheddar are good because they're gonna run a little bit, but they're still all in there. And I kind of overstuff some of them because I'm like, I get a little greedy with the cheese. Um, but these are why you wanna, we're gonna let these guys cool down before we put the honey on them, but you wanna let them cool down completely too because it's like molten lava in here. So oh, yeah, like, yeah. let's let it hang out. And then we're gonna come back with these because we're gonna finish up our mac and cheese. Don't wanna eat one of those right when they come out of the oven, you'll be very unhappy. All right, so check this out. So now you can see how thick the bechamel got now, but it's not like cement, it's still super runny. But like, look at that beautiful, it's got oh, that it's beautiful gorgeous. orange kind of rose color to oh, it now. Oh, it's beautiful, yeah. And it's like, it's. It's super, it's like smoky, but still delicate and just enough. And it's gonna play so well with the cheese and to finish with this ham. I wish you were here with us. So now we're gonna take this little handfuls at a time and just kind of gently make it rain over top and fold it in. And now mind you, while you're doing this, if for some reason like Maybe you had a little too much flour or you feel like it's getting a little too thick for you. It's okay to add a little more milk to this if you want. 
Again, for, I always say a recipe is a good guideline, but once you find your flavors that you really enjoy, that's part of the whole thing of taking a recipe and kind of turning it in and making it into something that, that you love too and want you to work with it as well. So feel free to experiment with it right now. And in addition to Damien's recipes, we uh, at Culture Media have created a PDF cookbook of recipes that were specially developed with Bayonne Ham. And that cookbook is going to be out in early May. So check back on our website. Um, actually, you'll get an invitation since we have your email address. Uh, you'll get an invitation to download that cookbook, which is completely free. And it's going to have lots of other terrific ideas about how to use this ham. I'm incorporating the last little bit. So look at that cheesiness, huh? Oh yeah. This stuff smells great. It looks great. And with that, when you make the roux, it kind of makes a base to melt that cheese in there and it all holds together really nice. It's gorgeous. So we're gonna take our, um, our gemelli. We're gonna go back to a, our, Soon, we're gonna slowly start incorporating some of this into it. So we're just gonna incorporate it into here, little by little. Yeah. 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 So while Damien is doing that, um, I'm going to. We're we're almost. To, we're down to ten minutes. I can't believe it. So um, I know that some of your questions have been answered, but. Um, if there are any other questions that you have for us, I'm going to try to answer them now to be closer to be able to see them. Um, any particular questions for Damien? Or about Bayonne Ham? No, I know you guys all just want to go home and make all these things. Let me see. So we're going to take some of our, some of our crispy ham now and fold that into here. And just because we need more ham in our life, we're going to top it off too. So we're going to plate this up a little bit. Oh, I'm seeing that someone is thrilled by the nutrition profile since they just started keto. That's awesome. Yep. For Damien, are there types of pasta that work best for mac and cheese? Yeah, I mean, I would want to find something that's got something to hold on to. Like, obviously, a thinner pasta, like a spaghetti, won't work, but like a lumache or a shell, or that's why you see other macaroni all the time, too. But like the Gemelli, find something like a campanella work, too, and find something that you like to eat, too. And like, this is something that we make in the restaurant for the Pico La Pasta brand. Um, and I love this because it's super versatile. So here's our finished dish. It has the ham inside and it has the ham crispy on top for some added texture. And then we're just gonna finish it off with a nice little smattering of some fresh chopped parsley. And you have that guy. Oh, I think our bread's done. Oh, yeah. Whoa, this guy. <laughs> Check this out. So you can see how that ham's all spud in there. Look at all the ripples. And look, if you can hear, it's kind of got like a hollow sound to it when you're baking focaccia. That hollow sound is a telltale sign that it's gonna be ready. We have a question about how to, what's the best way to store Bayonne ham? Um, because uh, this person says they can't get the open and reseal packages to work. Um, I've stored mine just um, tightly wrapped in some saran yeah. and um, try to eat an open package within, say, probably five days, I would think, five to seven. Usually doesn't last that long. Yeah. So you can see, I want to make a little cross cut on the section so you can see how, you know, that's beautiful inside there. It's nice. It's tight. Um, this is going to be great to eat right out of the oven, day of, or you can tightly wrap it 
toast it in the oven um, the next day and slice it around pieces. It also makes great sandwiches the next day too, with the toast in. We're, uh, gonna, we're gonna finish this guy off. You could completely get the lily and make a bayon ham sandwich. Yeah. With the bayon like ham focaccia. Double down the bayon in the So I'm gonna make a couple of slices here. And what I'm gonna do then. Oh, Damien, let me ask you this really good question. Yeah. Um, when cooking with a ham like Bayonne's, you cut back on using other salts. Yes, depending upon, like, I wouldn't see, like, I didn't season the macaroni and cheese as much because I added Bayonne to it in the right before and the finished product. So we'll cut back a little bit. I did put just a touch in, but I'd season the pasta more itself, but I didn't really season the bechamel as much because a lot of that slimy is going to go into your bechamel. That's a very, very, very good question. And then we're just gonna drizzle a little bit of olive oil. Oh, wow. Because, you know, everybody loves olive oil. It's healthy for you, it's good. And then some of this fresh basil on top of everything. And I mean, this is a great afternoon snack, glass of rose. Let's hang out on the patio and just talk and about nothing, you know? And then let's grab our dates and our asparagus. Oh, yeah. So now this is our asparagus, so it's cooled down now. And now you can kind of see how the cheese just melted on there a little bit. And you're gonna see when I pick it up, see how it kind of stuck to it a little bit, like a little web? That stays on there. So think about like, if you know what a Frico is, like fried cheese, like in a, in a pan or whatever, and crisp up, this is kind of like the anti-Frico. It's just melted, but it stays on there. and still gives you that bright flavor of the cheese. So this stuff is great now. Like, look at that, that's awesome. So we're just gonna lay this stuff out and arrange on here. I'm like, look at that one, yeah. So this is great, this, you can have them just like this or you can cut them in half and put them in the salad how we were talking about before. And these are great, you know, like brunch style or they can currently be you know, dinner and everything. So it's awesome. And now we got our dates, so good. Of we're just gonna plate these guys up here in a little row. They look so so good. Oh, they smell so good. I wish I seriously the smell in here is just the scent. I should say the scent is amazing. And then we're just gonna take that walnut honey and just go right down the middle of it. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, that's great. That is great. Oh, those are beautiful. You should, yeah, hold that up. Oh my gosh. So those are awesome, huh? Check out those guys. And I love how the cheese oozes out just a little bit. And these are like flavor bombs. They're gonna be, they're, these are like, I'm in your face, I'm delicious. You want another one? <laughs> so yeah, that's our stuff. And I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you could tell, but I'm kind of excited to cook with bayon ham. Um, this is this is fun. Hope you're excited to cook with bayon ham too, because you can see the versatility of it. You can enjoy it just like this, or you can enjoy it like this as well. This is beautiful, Damien. Thank you so yeah. much. This has been really, really fun and informative, and I can't. Lucky me, I get to dig in a little bit. Um, so, on behalf of Culture Media. I would like to once again thank the Consortium du Jambon de Bayon and my good friend Damien Santinetti. Thank you for having me. And Fort Food Lab, our venue here in Portland, Maine. Thank you so much, everyone.